is the right rev of speed, or as I like to call him, the right rev of reb. Re Listen to me. Like he's playing for Ole Miss or something, the right rev of reb. He's a right rev of speed. I at least can uh, do that without a, a tongue twister. Jerry Bonkowski, uh, you read his story on our Facebook page about seven uh, drag racing figures donating their brains uh, upon their death uh, to science to study CTE. Uh, we also couldn't join us yesterday because of, you know, uh, I was a little under the weather, but now after another great race, I mean, it was really a great race, I thought, there in New Hampshire. Uh, he joins us. Jerry, it's always nice to hear you. First, I want to talk to you a little bit about your story on uh, the drag on the drag racers and uh, CTE. What kind of feedback have you gotten? I know you thought it was going to be real big, but yeah, what kind of feedback have you received from your story that you can read on our 1420 NBC Sports Radio Tri-Cities Facebook page? Virtually every comment from readers, and there were hundreds of them, uh, was positive, except for one, which I, I have to share this one to you, because okay. as, as the old saying goes, there's always one in a crowd. Somebody uh, wrote in that, well, if they, hit, if they donate their brains to science now, how are they going to drive the car? <laughs> and I'll leave that one at that, but, you know, for the most part, like I said, 99% of the, the comments were positive, and... Uh, I think, you know, it, I mean, it wasn't my story. It was what, you know, these eight individuals, you know, Don Schumacher and her mm -hmm. seven drivers did. I mean, that's that's huge. You know, you've never seen a, 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 an effort like, of this magnitude. I mean, we've seen a number of individual athletes from various sports, like Dale Earnhardt Jr., several NFL players. I mean, they've mm -hmm. all, uh, you know, uh, pledged to donate their brains to science after they pass away. But to have an entire team, I mean, the team owner and the seven drivers, that's unheard of. And, you know, hopefully uh, not only will this make a, uh, you know, a, a significant uh, attention-getting thing for the team uh, for what they're doing, and it will also, you know, hopefully uh, convince other athletes to donate their brains as well. Because, you know, if we can find ways to minimize concussions, we can find ways to treat concussions better if we can have better protocols, that's what it's all about, to make it safer for the future generations, not just in motorsports, but in all of sports as well. Are concussions really uh, that big of a problem in drag racing? I mean, you're not, you know, going and sending people against the wall like you are in stock car racing. Uh, uh, you know, what's the concussion protocol? What's the concussion problem, if there is one, in the NHRA? Well, that's the interesting thing, because, you know, we've seen, like, for example, Dale Earnhardt Jr., yeah, how many concussions did he have? I think he had two or three in his career uh, at least. And, you know, that obviously got a lot of attention. But, you know, when you have drag racers hit the wall, you know, uh, in, in their races, a lot of times they're going 150, 200 miles an hour, maybe sometimes even faster than that. And uh, the, the irony is that even with uh, those serious crashes, the safety equipment that they have uh, essentially – uh, minimize the concussion risk that they they have to, you know, they, they they may suffer. Uh, I mean, like last year, I believe hmm. I think we had well, we had a number of crashes, and I think we only had one or two drivers that actually uh, resulted in concussion. I know Alexis DeJoria was one, uh, and you know uh, this year we've had a number of crashes, and there have been no concussions. I mean, it just it's kind of uh, illustrates just the the uh, not only the concussion protocol that the NHRA has to make sure that their drivers are safe, but you know, even more so is the safety equipment that they have, and it just shows how, how good it is, you know, to prevent these guys from getting concussions. Because, remember, you're talking about nine Gs in, in force when you're leaving the starting line, and imagine how many Gs of force you're going to have with, if you, you know, impact the wall. So uh, it really is a testament to what NHRA has done safety-wise over the years. Let me ask you this. I have a friend, uh, Bill Osborne, who uh, works for a company called Vices, and they came out uh, a little bit ago with a revolutionary helmet, it's being used by the University of Washington, where it has a soft shell, kind of like a car bumper. I mean, you think of a football helmet, what? Hard plastic, crack, crack, you know, and all that. 
But in this case, yeah, think car bumper. It's like a sponge on the outside, and then the hard shell is on the inside, if you will. And then I believe there's another, uh, uh, you know, piece of foam, uh, that sort of thing, or, or whatever protection uh, uh, between head and that hard shell. Has anything like this that you're aware of uh, come into motorsports with the helmets the drivers wear? Not really, but I will say this. Uh, I mean, if you look at the helmets that drivers wore, let's say, as recently as, let's say, 2000. Or sure. 2000, and you compare them to the uh, helmets they're wearing today, there is a significant change, uh, particularly in the size and the shape of the helmets. I mean, uh, these helmets today are much larger uh, they're more encompassing, you know, over the face and the neck. Uh, they just, you know, I mean, uh, when they first came out, a lot of, you know, people laughed that, you know, these look like, you know, almost like uh, alien kind of helmets. But, you know, the key is to minimize any uh, impact these drivers would have in the event of a wreck. And you know as well as I do, there's lots of places where there's lots of wrecks like Daytona and uh, Talladega and others. So, you know, they have these larger, and, and I, I, I don't like to call them oversized helmets, but they're oversized for a reason, more padding, more protection, things like that. Now, they haven't gotten into any kind of a helmet like you're describing where there's a soft shell and then the inner, uh, uh, interior side of the helmet is, is harder. It's actually the other way around. The hard shell is on the outside and the uh, padding is on the inside. So uh, that would be interesting to watch how this uh, whole new uh, helmet uh, design uh, develops because, you know, if, if it can help uh, further help the uh, folks in motorsports, Certainly, it's worth a uh, look-see to see what can do and how it can help them. Yeah, I know, uh, you know, the Vice's home, I mean, the people at Riddle, I've, uh, I, I did a big story on this for Saturday Down South, not uh, a couple of years ago, Joey Bonkowski, but, uh, and talked to people who are in helmet design at Virginia Tech and all sorts of things. But yeah, the people at Riddle were a little bit, uh, I don't know about this soft shell. What we think is that if we custom fit the helmet, and they've been doing uh, that, but uh, I can tell you, like you said, since 2000, uh, not only in motorsports, but football helmets, uh, you know, prior to about 2002, helmets, as we know, they're basically designed to prevent skull fracture. Uh, since that time, since about, to my knowledge, at least in football, is 2002, it was then designed not only for skull fracture, but also concussions as well. And uh, it, it's kind of funny because I'm, I'm told, actually, and this is a couple of years old, that Tom Brady still feels more comfortable wearing the old style uh, skull fracture helmet. So, you know, that's something he's always been more comfortable with. If I can use equipment in other sports like Bob Boone and the single bar catcher's mask. He was the last guy to want to do that in the major leagues. You know, uh, Brady a bit of uh, also a throwback in that uh, regard. Anyway, I'm talking about racing, though, with Jerry Bonkowski. And, uh, you know, it, just along those lines, I know in Chicagoland, you were critical of the ending, the, you know, uh, knock them all around that I loved. Well, you had a little of that with Harvick and Bush uh, with seven laps to go in New Hampshire. Did you still feel the same way of this just isn't safe or was it just old fashioned, uh, you know, racing on a track in, in stock car racing to you? How do you take uh, how Harvick overcame Bush to take the lead? bear with me on how I explained it. Okay. You know, when you have an instance like that, I mean, I'm not in favor of any kind of blocking. I haven't been in favor for the last 20 years. Uh, but there are certain tracks, and New Hampshire is definitely one of them. Phoenix would be another one. Uh, and Bristol, for that matter. Although Bristol, it's, it's inherent that you're going to have wrecks. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, you can go to these tracks, and they're not as fast as, let's say, a Darlington or a Talladega or a Daytona or whatever. Uh, and so the the, uh, the risk factor of injury, you know, is, is lightened, if you will, uh, because you're not going as fast. Now, remember, though, at New Hampshire, you know, we lost uh, uh, Kenny Irwin and we lost Adam Petty, too, as well, you know, back, uh, yeah. what, uh, 20, well, no, it's 18, 19 years ago, I guess it would have been. So, you know, it, it, you can still have uh, a tragedy occur in a place like that. But the point I'm making is that, you know, it's, if you want to call it safer to have, you know, bump and run at any place, you know, New Hampshire would probably be right near the top of the list where it's probably the safest to do it at, as opposed to a place where you're doing 200 miles an hour, like a Texas Motor Speedway or a Las Vegas Motor Speedway. You know, I think you see where I'm coming from with this. Uh, but again, you know, going back to the, the whole uh, core or the, or the base of my uh, contention is that I'm just not a big fan of blocking. I'm not a fan of putting the, the bumper to the other driver and spinning them. I just don't feel that's right. I think 
Well, you can hear Jerry Bonkowski is a motorsports writer. And I think that that's where that comes in because you do a lot of indie uh, writing for NBCSports.com and certainly NHRA and such in addition to NASCAR. But, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the stock car fan, and you've got a lot of those around here, may not necessarily agree because what do you hear in, in down south? Oh, yeah, NASCAR, that's the best kind of racing, you know, and all that. that's the only one worth watching and such. Uh, and I think a lot of it is for that. But with your experience uh, with all of motorsports, yeah, I, I understand a little bit where you're coming from there. Uh, I did want to ask you, I know Eric Amaro, we had, you know, same four drivers. I think it's great. We had the same three drivers, excuse me, uh, Truex, Bush, and Harvick in the top four spots uh, up at New Hampshire. But the guy that snuck in is Eric Amarola. And it seemed like, you know, that there was some interesting comments made by Kevin Harvick afterward, you know, uh, that, oh, he had the best car, he won the race. And, you know, Harvick was never all that Danica Patrick friendly, but at the same time, I kind of thought, Boy, that is a backhanded compliment, isn't it? Guy in your same race team, he had the best car, but he didn't win the race. He only finished third. What What are your thoughts on uh, kind of the Kevin Harvick and Kevin Harvick and how he took uh, the finish of Eric Amarola? Well, I think that you know, obviously, as a race car driver, he realized just how good Amarola was. He just happened to be his teammate as well, too. Um, I mean, had it not been for you know, Harvick and Kyle Busch in the bump and run, El Morello had a pretty good chance of winning that race. And that's not to take away from what Harvick did or how he won or anything like that. Uh, the, the point is that, uh, you know, uh, I, I know I saw a quote, I think it was from Harvick, I'm pretty sure, that, you know, he kind of felt bad that, you know, El Morello had a chance to win and it would have been his first, um, well, it would have been his second couple win in his career, but it would have been the first one that was not, you know, due to rain shortened. Uh, it would be a full, complete race. A win is, is basically what I'm getting at. So, I mean, you know, he realized that uh, even though he didn't have the best car, he did win up winning. But you know, he gave credit and props to his teammate because he did have the best car. And, you know, had it not been for, you know, circumstances, he may have been in victory lane as opposed to Kevin Harvick. So I thought it was actually pretty classy of Kevin to, you know, to, to tout what his, his, uh, his teammate did and, you know, how he came so close. And, you know, if, if, if he does and doesn't win this week, maybe next week Eric Elmer will win. You never know. I mean, it's, it's showing that, you know, he's getting more uh, acclimated, more, more familiar, and more uh, at home, I guess you would say, in Stuart Haas racing. And that's a good sign for him. It's a good sign for his sponsor. It's a good sign for the organization as well, too. Possibly. I do think, though, that having a top-heavy, and I know this Harvick's sixth victory of the, uh, uh, of the campaign, but I really do think that having top heavy, you know, a, a few stars to follow is good uh, for the sport. I really do. I know it seems a little bit like baseball with uh, the haves and have nots, but I'll, I'll ask you that. I mean, do you think there's a problem with the haves and the have nots with competitive balance in NASCAR? I mean, everybody says there is in baseball, but do you think the same applies to NASCAR or is it good uh, to have a few top heavy that new fans, uh, get to, top heavy drivers, new fans know to follow. What's your opinion, Jerry Bonkowski? Well, you know, I've said this many times that uh, NASCAR is a very cyclical sport where, um, you know, guys do good one day or one week or one month or one year or one season, whatever you want to call it, and then they don't do well, you know, the next time. And, you know, our memories sometimes get very, very short. Uh, in, in, in you know NASCAR, I mean, I'm talking about the fans and the media to a certain extent, because you know you have three guys that are essentially running away with the series this year, I and mean, with all the wins they've had, you know, Kevin Harvick, Mark Truex Jr., and Kyle Busch. But if you look back, uh, you know there was a lot of criticism of Jimmy Johnson in mm -hmm. all the years that he won his seven championships. You know that he was you know, he dominated too much, he won too much, uh, and you know that a lot of times would say, well, that's part of the reason why, you know, I've kind of lost interest in NASCAR or I'm not watching as much as I used to. And you can kind of draw the same corollary, I think. And, and I'm not trying to make this a negative thing against Harvick, Bush, and, and Truex, but, you know, if you're a fan, let's say, of a Brad Keselowski, Joey Logano, um, Clint Boyer, although he's won already won a couple times, but, um, you know, guys that have, you know, have not had the year that they you know, would have liked to up to this point, if you're a fan of those guys, you're probably getting tired of seeing you know, Harvick and, and Bush and Truex doing so well. And that, you know, on the one hand, it's good for fans to see their favorite drivers, the three favorite drivers, winning as much as they are. But, you know, what is it doing for the drivers, the fans 
thing, as it turns out. So, um, you know, it's kind of a mixed, mixed bag, Marty, because, you know, it's it's good for NASCAR that you're seeing, you know, such dominance and, you know, these three guys going at it, you know, neck and neck, which is good. But it just seems to me that, you know, there's there's other drivers that are maybe not, are not getting the recognition that they, uh, they probably should get, but that's also tied in the fact that they're not winning. You know, so it's, it's really a, a hard thing to balance. It really is. Well, I'll ask you this. I mean, we've, we've talked about this a while back. Chevy, maybe the pony car doesn't compare to the sedans, although it looks like it's going to be going all pony car very shortly. Uh, but anyway, I, I, I was reading uh, about how Chevy struggles, haven't won since the Daytona 500, and it was uh, written that, you know, usually when one manufacturer would have an advantage over the other, historically NASCAR has some sort of uh, rules change to even up the playing field. We haven't seen that this season. Do you have any idea why? That's a million-dollar question. A lot of people have been asking that. And, you know, I think that NASCAR feels comfortable that the parity is indeed there. And, you know, to an extent, I agree with them. I think the parity is there. I just think that the Chevrolet-powered teams have just had such a difficulty in, um, you know, adjusting their, uh, or not just not adjusting, but, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, in, in changing their ways with the, from the old car to the new car to the Camaro, and they're still struggling. I mean, you know, there, we've talked about this in the past, too, like when, uh, when Toyota came out with the Camry back in, what was it, 07 or 08, whatever it was, mm -hmm. uh, you know, those Toyota teams took, you know, two, three years to really get get going. I think it, what was it, like something like four years before Toyota won a race or something. I, mean, I, I, I may not be, I may be off in years, but whatever the point is, whatever the case is, though, the point is that, you know, it's just a matter of adaptation and uh, uh, finding the, the formula. And a lot of these Chevy teams just haven't found a formula. I mean, it, and that says something that, you know, when you have an organization, let's say like Hendrick Motorsports, you know, arguably one of the best teams in the, uh, in the business, and if they are still having problems trying to find, uh, you know, uh, uh, success with the Camaro, this you know, especially even at this late stage in the season, it just shows you how difficult it is to to to, uh, to adapt. Now the thing is, if NASCAR were to go in tomorrow and say, okay, we're making all these changes in favor of the Camaro to make it more competitive, well then you know as well as I do, yeah, the Ford mm -hmm. teams are going to scream, you know, saying, well, why are they getting the advantage? Yeah, you can say, well, maybe it would be to bring parity, but I think the parity is there. It's just a matter of these teams finding the way to win. And I think that sooner or later, somebody's going to break through. Now, uh, I wouldn't be surprised. Now, this, this may be a real stretch for a lot of your listeners to believe, but uh, I think that you know, these Chevys are going to be a big surprise in the playoffs. I think that. Interesting. You know, what's that? Interesting, I just said. Yeah, Chevy's yeah, a big I, surprise I, in the playoffs. I, Go ahead. think this is going to be the case because this really is like and I'm going to go back to my uh, sports history knowledge here prior to the 1978 baseball playoffs uh, somebody saying I'll tell you who's going to win this one for the Yankees Bucky Dent you know why do you think uh, that Chevy is a sleeping giant Well, 
intriguing. If that happened, then the guys that have dominated the season, one of them, would certainly be left out. Exactly. He's Jerry He's Jerry Bonkowski, NBCSports.com, covering motorsports. And uh, I don't know, though. I mean, I, I do kind of see the Ford and the Toyota doing so well with the sedans over the Camaro. It's just sort of like that one, uh, an old muscle car guy like me sort of says, hey, don't tell me they're too heavy. Don't tell me they're too heavy. Tri-City Sports now. I'm going to talk Media Watch bottom of the hour. All right.